please give a warm welcome to Alexander Faust, Deep Learning for Robot Navigation. It's going to be lots of videos, so hopefully it will stay away. But I'm going to start on a personal note. This is a picture of my grandmother and my cousins, and I'm the one in the middle. My grandmother was fantastic. I really love her. She was, she was an entrepreneur. She ran a fashion design home, a uh, business out of our home. But she was born with a mobility impairment. And every step that she took in her life was painful. She was never able to leave the home. And growing up, I had to do lots of errands for her, bring her things, and so on. I never minded. OK. I never minded, but it always made me wonder if there's something that could be done better for her. Fast forward in time, right now in the United States, there's 11 million people who can't leave their homes with some sort of mobile assistive device. That is combined population in the New York City and Los Angeles. Three and a half million people, or the entire state of Connecticut, never leaves their home. That's lots of people. Autonomous robots, service robots that go and autonomously navigate and run errands, bring packages, food, medicine, and so on, can make tremendous opportunity to help and improve lives of these people. So we need navigation at scale, on real robots, in real world. Big words, what does it mean? All right, let's look at the video. This is a fetch robot going, running in the micro kitchen just like one, I don't know if you guys saw it here today, going from the same start position to that sink, and we just let the camera roll for, I don't know, about 10 minutes. I want you to pay attention is how much things change around. Now there's a person there that blocked the way, there's another person coming in. That's real world. This is what the robots need to deal with. Check out the next one, now there's a janitor coming. We did not make this up. <laughs> By the way, this is, a <laughs> this is a fully learned system. There are no tricks, and the rest of the talk is about how we got there. The same fetch robot is 250 pounds and maximum speed of three miles an hour. Colliding with it is kind of equivalent of football player walking into you or running into you. You don't want that. Safety is important, right? Second thing is, robots come in all shapes or sizes, right? They have their sensors. Every robot has a different sensor and experiences the world in a different way. They have different dynamics, how they move. And they have different bodies, right? They can fit through different places. So the little guy here next to Fetch is the same, actually, robot without its head. It's 100 pounds lighter, but it's also twice as fast. The, so that's something that we need to keep in mind. And if we're looking at navigation at scale, we want safe and feasible motion in the dynamic world that these robots can do. The standard solution, which consists of, okay, we perceive the world, we have perception, tells us where things are, then goes to the motion plan, planning layer that says, okay, now that I know where the objects are, I'm gonna plan my path, and then that path is being sent to the controller, that then goes and executes the path, doesn't scale. And the reason it doesn't scale is because each layer doesn't know about the limitations of the layer above. And every time we put the robot in a new environment, we need to hand tune and fix bugs and correct these assumptions between the layers. There needs to be a human in the loop to fix that. So how do we go around that? Let's look at the biological systems. We learn curriculum of skills. Everything we do, we experience the world with our sensors, and we express ourselves with motion, speech, or however. Interface is the same, regardless of what I'm doing. So can we take inspiration from biological systems and do something similar? Let's go take a step further. So evolution determines our abilities. Evolution determines the system that we have that enables us to learn certain level of tasks. Next to that, then we interact with the world. This is my daughter learning to navigate. <laughs> <laughs> and 
learn how to learn, uh, learn through trial and error. And after we have some skills, we go and reflect on them. How good I am at this speaking business? Where can I improve? How I'm good at navigation? There was a break here, I was trying to get to the stage. Some people are better than others, right? <laughs> In getting that. But we have some self-awareness of our abilities. So if we take that inspiration, the way evolution, uh, reinforcement learning or learning skills, and then self-reflection or in building intuition, what's easy and what's not, what would be the most basic navigation skill? Well, we just saw it. It was basically getting to the sink or getting here to the stage. You just need to kind of get your destination and you need to deal with whatever is in your way to deal with it, right? It connects directly sensors with acting with controls. And the output is a sequence of feasible actions to reach a nearby goal. That's what we call point-to-point -point policy. And for dynamical systems, if you have background in math, it's actually, there is only a solution for very limited number of systems. Otherwise, it's numeric, it's MP-hard problem, and there are, you need to fall back to the numerical systems. No numer to numerical solutions. So let's use reinforcement learning for that. We have our robot. We want to learn a policy. You guys familiar with reinforcement learning, generally what it does? Okay. The <clears throat> so we need to take our observations. What are the observations? It's what this robot observes, and this is the noisy LiDAR observation. You can read white here as there is room in front of me. Black, there is a wall. And this is basically 220 degrees folded out into. And the gray things, that's noise, because there's always noise. We need to fit several last observations to kind of have the estimate of the motion in the environment. We train it in static environment. This is a map of yet another micro kitchen. I don't know why we're obsessed here with the micro kitchens. <laughs> but it has static obstacles. It's a small place and you just will let it go and roam around in that space. The question is, what is the reward here? What is objective? Objective is to go and reach the goal, right? Good. You put reinforcement learning to that, it becomes intractable. It needs to explore forever before it finds the goal, so that's not quite going to work. The alternative is to set the rewards and then you hope for the best. And tuning the rewards turns out to be a very labor-intensive process. True story, I had an intern last summer that spent a month going through 25 different generations trying to find different rewards and did not work. <laughs> the E, and then we figured it. So the second question is, what is the neural network architecture for this policy? And th this is art as well. We're guessing how many layers, how deep they are, what, what activation functions and all that sort of stuff. We're guessing. Just for example, why reward tuning is hard. This is the policy that has our best hand-engineered policy, so to speak. It gets to where it needs, but it's very suboptimal motion. <laughs> also known as a drunken robot. So what do we do? We automate the reinforcement learning. We combine the ideas from genetic algorithms with evolution, and with reinforcement learning and do two, lay, two steps. In first one, we involve the reward to learn the reward that is able to learn the task. And then in the second layer, we, with a fixed reward, we go and learn the neural network architecture. So we start a population of reinforcement learning agents. Each one of them has a slightly different reward out of the rewards are given as a parameterized, or the whole macro decision process is really given as a parameterization. Then we go after their train and we evaluate them against the task objective. Get to the sink or get to, the, to wherever it needs to go. We're randomizing the goal in the environment. After the training, we then mutate the reward, find the next one, select the best policy. Once we're through the training, we run a total of 1,000 agents, 100 agents in parallel processing at the time. We have the reward, we fix the reward, and then we repeat the same process with a fixed reward 
varying the neural network architecture. But this time we're actually evaluating against the cumulative reward because the reward is fixed. Now we're comparing apples to apples, right? And at the end we have our neural network architecture. The whole process takes about a week to train. It's not cheap by any means, but it's generalizable. We can train it. This is our training simulation environment. Raised floors and it goes and runs around, hits the walls. It's all good. No, no real people there. And, the, and then it directly transfers to the robot. This is my dog. He had the best day, lots of treats that day. <laughs> the, but here in this way, I'm blocking its way. It's trying to go behind me. And notice how it turns around. And then once I move around, it blocks and finds its way back. That's pretty cool. That's a transferable skill, right? We invested time in training, but it's promising, right? We can use that in many as a building block. This is the freight robot, basically running the similar thing, just much faster. Comparing to the classic approaches, classic approaches produce very smooth trajectories. The moment you start adding sensors, no, sensor and localization and all that noise for them, they start breaking down. The RL algorithms, vanilla without tuned rewards, they still get to where they need, they, they, they're coping with the, uh, with the noise, but they're not optimal. We saw that they're doing the looping. So the question now is how well this generalizes. So we did a benchmarking for several Mojako environments. The first one was done on DDPG for, with sparse goal. Now we're looking PPO and soft actor critic and doing the simple. Uh, so in these Mojako environments, say for humanoid, the really goal, the task that we want to do is make it go as fa far as it can, maximize the distance travel. But somebody spent time engineering the reward, right? And we consider that as a complex objective. So we're going to evaluate against that. First question we ask is how well this works. Complicated graph. I'm going to say orange is the out RL. Uh, blue baseline is the hyperparameters tuned. And the green baseline is the baselines that are from the OpenAI gym. The, basically, the more complex task is the out RL improves you, helps you much better. And there is the video of the humanoid running. We're actually running. The other methods are walking. <laughs> <laughs> the second question is, does it make sense to spend time and engineer multi-objective, or can I just spend time says, this is really what I care about. Here are some ideas of what the reward should contain, and let it run. So out of all the graphs, I'm going to let you focus on this one here. The light red is uh, optimized over the standard objective. This is the multi-objective, the complex reward that's given with the Mojako environments. The red one is the one that's trained and optimized over simple distance traveled. And then even though it's optimized over that, we're evaluating over the complex standard reward. And that's the gap in the performance. So it's probably not worth, if you, if you can afford computational resources, it's probably not worth your time to go and hand engineer the solutions. Third question is, if I have a fixed computational budget, should I go hyperparameter tuning or the reward search? And basically, this graph tells us that you're more likely to get better policy faster tuning the rewards and searching rewards than finding the hyperparameters with a caveat that these hyperparameters are reasonable. If you have not reasonable hyperparameters, then you're out of luck. So AutoRL in general, evolution determines internal rewards that enable agent to learn the task, and then reinforcement learning learns that task given the abilities of the agent. And we get better policies with less engineering. Okay, so these were the basic skills. How do we mo move on to more complex skills? You guys all made it here to this room, right? Along your way here, you made some decisions. You had some waypoints that you were then kind of, you get there and you deal however you're going to get there. 
So the long-range navigation task, we can think of it as a sequence of feasible waypoints that lead to the goal. And the question then is, how do we find the sequence of the goals? So one naive solution is now we have our skill. We have our auto rel agent that we trained. We invested time in training it. And we say we want to put a robot in one of these buildings, and we're given the map. The idea is from the sampling-based planning. Anybody familiar with sampling-based planning? OK. Here's like a 30, 15 second overview. You take a map, the environment, you sample the points randomly. You take any sample, says, hey, is this a valid sample? Yes, you keep it, no, you discard it. Now that you have a sample, you need to connect them into a road graph or a road map. And the way you do that, you take for every sample, you find its neighbors, and then you roll out this trajectory, and in this case, we use uh, out RL policy to roll them, roll it out, and since it's stochastic, we roll it out multiple times, and we only keep edges that can be that that agent can navigate consistently. Once we have the roadmap, now we know that these waypoints are traversable by that agent, and they tune nicely, and we can use it then to go and search the graph to find the solution. So here is an example of one of them. So just notice here that, for example, here the roadmap is not connected. And if you zoom it in, there is actually a pole here. There's like a pillar in the middle. And that particular robot is noisy enough that can navigate that, so that edge is not there. Putting that on a robot, we actually, the results are for the success rates are the same in simulation and in reality, so we close the sim to real gap, which is good. But the, the paths are not optimal. <laughs> and it's not computationally expensive. Uh, easy. For building a roadmap like this, we need to evaluate something in the order of 100,000 uh, edge connects, and that takes time, and we end up with the zigzag paths. But we can do long range, and it's a very immature skill. Think of it as an immature complex skill. So how we can make the connections step uh, more tractable? So if we focus on finding what are the most relevant, this is a search problem, right? We have a sample, we have options, find the most relevant samples that are ahead of us, and then connect. Question now is, can we practice the skill, reflect on it, and get better? So for example, we practice our out RL policy in a completely new environment, run a trajectory, observe the sensors, what the sensors were at the beginning, and observe the metric over the entire trajectory that we are interested in, and note that. For example, if I'm interested is, how long is it going to take me to get out of the door, given that my sensor observation is everybody's sitting, so it's probably easy. And if my sensor observation is like everybody's walking around, it's a break time, it's probably more complicated. And by kind of using that and exposing agents to these experiences, we collect a data set, then, then we can train a predictor. We can train a predictor that takes sensor observation, that metric, and can tell me how likely that I'm going to get to that door in time. And then we apply that when we're planning new, new environments to reduce the search time. And particular metrics that we're interested in here are feasibility, safety, and importance of the samples. So the first one, first metric, I'm going to talk about three metrics, is time to reach. So this is exactly what I said, getting to the door during the break or not during the break. Or if I'm driving a car, if I ask you to go 10 meters ahead, it says, okay, this is easy, but if, um, if there is a wall in front of you, you're gonna say, no, that's not easy, that's gonna be hard. So we observe the agent and then we build a map. On the right is, basically it's a heat map, the goal is in the middle, and it's the estimates how difficult or what is the time to reach to the center of the map. On the left side is trained. There is difference, it's conservative, but around the goal, it has a good estimate what is feasible and what's not feasible. Then we use it to build a tree. The blue tree is the standard method. Green is this RLRT algorithm as we saw it. It's much smoother path. 
There are two reasons why it's smoother. One is because we're using AutoRail and this system does not have the steering function that I mentioned to boundary problem and AutoRail learns it. And the second one is that the search is more focused. So this is what the building a tree looks like. It's trying to get to the goal and it's kind of biasing the search towards the goal until it gets there. This is what looks on the robot. On the left side is the zigzag zag naive approach. And after learning the feasibility and kind of focusing on more or on the easier samples, we get smoother paths. The second metric is what we call sweat volume. Basically the idea here is looking at the efficiency of the motion. It's saying that my, I should be doing this when I'm walking, right? <laughs> I should minimize my volume. Through, through the trajectory, so we can learn that, and the one on the left is the Baxter robot, basically minimizing the volume of the motion, whereas the one on the right is not. Third one, and the last example, is, let me give you an intuition. If I need to go to Seattle from here, what would be my first waypoint? that door, <laughs> right? <laughs> I don't care what's happening afterwards, right? But there are like three door, four doors in this room and there are points of interest. Stage or in the middle of the hallway or the cameraman, they're not points of interest. And the idea here is that there are important waypoints that are locally recognizable that don't depend on the larger picture that we can learn. So how do we do that? We have the naive long range planner that goes through our waypoints and finds. We go and traverse these waypoints and then we pay attention and say, okay, for each waypoint that I traversed, how important it is. How many times I traversed it? And if I remove it, is it still, does the, the connectivity of the space breaks? It's called between us centrality. So if both conditions hold, this is an important point. And in that case, we want to know that. So then we train a predictor that says, okay, given my neighborhood, given my local picture, what I can observe, and a point, how important do we think this point is for this particular robot? And then in the new environment, when we start building a roadmap, we say, hey, okay, this sample, if this sample is important, I want to connect it to the other important stuff, and this local, less important stuff, I should just connect locally. So we end up with the hubs so to speak. I want to connect doors to doors, hallways to hall, the, the, that kind of stuff without explicitly saying that this is a door, this is a hallway. So here's a picture. This is our training data set. Uh, if you've been to Mountain View, this is the Googleplex, the four buildings down there. We traversed along the way. And it turns out that there are four buildings that have big two, like four hallways, walkways that are connected. Guess what? They're important, right? <laughs> It learns that narrow passages, doorways, hallways, entries to the hallways are important. Once we train and apply, so we say, okay, this is the small patch of the environment, the local, and there are several samples there, how important they are. Well, this one is not very, because there is nothing much that you can go here, but these bigger ones, this kind of leads to lots of places that's important. This is applied training set, never seen before. And we create roadmaps that are about 100 times more efficient. So this is naive planning with kind of these extra waypoints. <laughs> it kind of goes around a little bit. Is there not smooth it out? Okay, it comes to that. Go around and so on. And the next one is the smoother, the hierarchical uh, roadmap with critical samples already there. Pretty much goes, there is suboptimality here. Okay, so we talked about connecting, sensing, and acting without RL, and learns better policies with less engineering, and bakes in the robot dynamics uh, with sensors directly. Then we practice a skill, and we observe what we learned, and we learn to estimate feasibility, efficiency, and importance with respect to the ability of that particular policy. And then we fold that back into planning, and we have faster and efficient, higher level planning within robots or policies abilities. 
the genetic algorithms, reinforcement learning, and supervised working, uh, learning working together. And each, if you can improve any of these dimensions, better genetic algorithms, better reinforcement learning, or self-supervised, the whole system can improve and get better of time, over time. And with more experience, our navigation improves on real robots in real world. Now that's a first step towards larger, and this is a research project we're now building. There is a lot more work to do. There are lots of interesting questions over what are the right metrics, what is the right curriculum of skills, how we put them together, and so on. But some, one interesting way to combine different things to get to scale in navigation and hopefully have, help lots of people in the process. And I want to thank my collaborators for some references, and thank you guys. Spending afternoon. <laughs>